Hey everyone, welcome to the third live episode of the podcast, the Fresh Focus Sports Podcast. Today we have a special guest. His name is Will Harris from Anatomy of a Fighter. And Will has one of the most successful sports documentary channels on YouTube. I'm definitely jealous of his subscriber account, 430,000. Will is a beast on there. He's really well known for following Habib Nurmagomedov. And we should have Will any second. And uh, yeah, there he is, do rag and all. What's good, Will? Eating his popcorn. All right, so I'm gonna give you just a quick little introduction for anyone who doesn't know. Um, Will is Will Harris. Uh, he's from the brand Anatomy of a Fighter. Um, it's not just a UFC brand. It's it's not just an MMA brand. It's a fighting brand. And what he does is he documents fighters' stories um, all over. Um, so he's best known for, I'd say, following Habib Nurmagomedov, who's you know one of the greatest champions of all time. Um, but I'm gonna really get into with Will is how he got his channel started and truly how he did it independently. I mean, dude's a beast. He does it by himself. There's no crew. I've been side by side with him all over the world filming for other um, for other shows but we were in the same spots and he truly does it by himself so Will real quick just give me a background of how uh, Anatomy of a Fighter got started and, and what, what would the purpose was it at first I know what it evolved into but tell me what Anatomy of a Fighter was well I had just did uh, a documentary in China uh, on a basketball player named Justin Dittman um, it was called A Hunger for More. We went, you know, went to China, did a documentary on his, the end of his season going into the playoffs. So I spent about two months over there. And then when I got back to Florida, I had nothing to do. So I had knew some fighters. Um, and I was just like, you know what? I want to try to see if I can put together some low budget documentary on fighters since I know a couple of these guys. So let me find out who has a fight coming up. Right. Um, ironically, uh, Michael Johnson had a fight. Uh, I vaguely knew him. He was going to fight Habib, ironically. I didn't know who Habib was. I just knew he was some undefeated fighter from Russia. Um, Michael paid me like $1,000 to just film content for him over a week. And we was just going to do like this mini little embedded style series for Instagram that was only a minute long, 30 seconds long, every day leading up to the fight. So what happened was, since we was only shooting this micro mini style series for him just to recap his daily training and things like that, I had so much footage left over that I was like, I should take some of this footage and make a documentary out of it, you know, because I was getting side interviews and things like that. And uh, the first thing that came to my mind was, I'm going to call it anatomy of a fighter. I just kind of thought about the Michelangelo human body, you know, arms out. So I'm thinking like a diaphragm of a fighter, heart, you know, will, power, you know, things like that. And um, I said, you know what, what I'm going to do is since I'm in Florida, I was living in South Florida at the time. I'm just going to film all these fighters around Florida and try to get, you know, sit down interviews, things like that. I ended up getting like a, uh, a contra like a little uh, why am I blanking right now like signature sign offs for you know using these sit down interviews releases and like yeah that. yeah a, a release form yeah I'll probably interview 50 fighters from the Luke Rockholds to the Rashad Evans to the Rumbles to everybody everybody that I felt like this is good enough to just release a documentary on um Michael Falk could be he lost uh and then I was just like, ah, the story doesn't can't end there. You know, this guy lost the fight, and it was potentially a big fight for Michael Johnson. So I just kept filming. And then eventually, um, I, I moved out to Vegas for a summer when Connor was going to fight uh, Floyd Mayweather because I felt like I just want to spend a summer somewhere else, try to build the documentary. Was, Anatomy of Fighter was clearly just going to be a documentary that I just say, hey, Amazon, Netflix, here, y'all can have this. Take it. You know, I just wanted to do that. I move on to something else. I wasn't intending on ever being honest. And um, honestly, I got the idea for the YouTube channel from Forrest Griffin. I was at the Institute. I was there almost every other day during that summer. 
And he was like, hey, what are you, what are you going to do with all the extra footage? That's exactly what he said. And I was like, I don't know. He was like, you should put some of this stuff on YouTube and see if people like it. So that day I went home, created a YouTube channel. You couldn't name it Anatomy Father. I just said, all right, let me put some of these old one-minute clips that I was making of all these fighters. You know, I had covered Michael Johnson and Justin Gaethje, like things like that. And they started to get views. I was like, oh, this got 3,000 views. This one got, you know, 2,000 views, 4,000 views. And then I remember doing like a, a Vendor Holyfield project and it got like 50,000 views. And I was like, yeah, I may have something here. People actually like this type of content. And then that's when on August 14th, 2017, I officially made an ad of a fighter, a channel. And that's the rest is history. So that's that's three years ago and over 430,000 subscribers, which is ridiculous. I was just pre-recording an intro and I was joking. I'm jealous as hell of that. But, you know, that's a lot of hard work. And for most people, three, you know, three years isn't that long of a time to build that up, to be honest. You are way past the curve. But I want you to explain for any filmmakers that are watching, any people in production, because I got a lot of people that hit me up, ask questions and stuff. That was three years ago. But what was the journey as a filmmaker to get to that point even three years ago? Because it's not just, it's you had to build up your skills and you had to build up your storytelling skills to get to the point where within three years when that opportunity hits, it could just accelerate. Somebody said, <laughs> what is, is this a haircut? This is a do-rag, not a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Think I got black dye on my head or something? <laughs> <laughs> But now, um, I started late. So this is to, you know, I was telling some young filmmaker on my page yesterday that's 21. I started when I was 29. I knew I wanted to do film at 19. I just pursued basketball before that. So I played basketball in high school. I was all state, top 50 in the country coming out of high school. Then I went and played for a small college in college and tore my ACL my sophomore year like going into my sophomore year. Right. I was 19. And um, I bought a camera back then. I was addicted to, you know, documentaries like Hoop Dreams and Banging in Little Rock and even reality TV shows like The Real World and things like that. I just yeah. loved documentaries. I was like, I could buy a camera, I could film whatever. It wasn't until I pursued basketball after college, tried out for pro teams, trying to go overseas, do the overseas thing, and nothing was really panning out. And I was like, I'm not going to make a long career out of this, even if I play for a long I'm not going to make a career out of it. So um, I had a job working in Minnesota. I was living in Minneapolis. I was a teacher's assistant. And um, the thing about Minneapolis is that it's freezing cold. Like, you know, New York is wintertime, it's, it's freezing cold. But I had a nine to five, and I was just like, yo, this ain't the life for me. I just don't know what I'm going to do with my life, but it ain't going to be this. So March 3rd, 2011 is the day. I need to get that tattooed on my body. I went to school that day, worked my normal shift, and then at the end of the day, I walked into the principal office, Randy Cook, at Brooklyn Park Elementary, and said, this is my last day. I'm, I'm never going to work again. And he was just like, why are you quitting? I was just like, listen, man, I'm miserable. I'm depressed. I'm working. Uh, every day is the same routine. I'm just not happy with my life. So that was the day I decided I was going to buy a camera. Uh, I didn't have any money. Uh, it was, I think, income tax was coming. I was able to get like $1,000, and I bought a Canon T2i and a 50-millimeter 1.8. The nifty 50, as everybody know. Yeah. And I started shooting random videos in my garage in Minnesota of cars arriving and putting music to it and focusing in on tires and things like that. And that started the, the, the trend. I probably didn't get paid for about eight months. I did a lot of free videos at that point. I found guys that were rappers. Yo, let me shoot your music video, right? Yeah. Give me fifty dollars. Give me twenty dollars. Yeah, no one wants to. He no one wants to hear that. But that's literally how you have to do it. It has. Yes. That's almost a year. I would say from March third, two thousand eleven, to March third, two thousand twelve. I probably made three hundred dollars. Like, think about that. Yeah. Right. And a lot. And I tell everybody that 
people want to go from here to there. I'm like, bro, I spent a year or two not making no money. And uh, my first ever paycheck ever in film, what do you think I did? It wasn't like a porn or nothing, but what did you think I did? For it, a wedding? No, it wasn't a wedding. I was dating this girl that was my barber. She was cutting my hair. Her stepdad owned a barbershop and was like, hey, I always see that camera in your hand. I need you to make a commercial for me. And it was Brookside Barbers. Uh, I made a commercial for $100 and five free haircuts. That was the deal. That's the yeah. first, first paycheck that Barter. ever said Will Harris Productions. It was $100 and then I got five free haircuts. Yeah. And that was just the grind. Yeah. And year two was the same thing. You know, I got, I was, I, I still had this T2I. I couldn't afford another lens, I think. Uh, that's when Roka 9 started to come out with their city lenses. I was able to upgrade to the Roka 9 35 millimeter 1.4 and I got better. I just got better. I knew what I wanted to do, but I always made the excuse like, because I don't have that equipment, I'm not good yet. That was used to be like, man, if I ever get yeah. a 5D Mark II, I'm telling you, I can shoot the movies like they do on, in, in Hollywood if I can get one of those cameras. But I, I feel like those struggle years of all of this journey, that helped my storytelling because I had to work with so little. You see what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I had nothing. So that's literally how the journey started. Um, my boy Rome said you should have held out for 10 haircuts. <laughs> I should have. Hey, Rome. <laughs> She was bad, though. So I I, hey, the girl that I was dating was bad. Yo, Will, so I, I want you to just kind of give me uh, this uh, thought process because I've explained this to some younger athletes. The chances of them making pro aren't really great, right? But with your camera, you're going to end up being in so many cooler spots in professional sports for the rest of your life that you would have never had in a five-year NBA career even. You know, like just think about where you've been over the world, Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, China, I've been everywhere. Yeah, everywhere with a camera. So kind of explain to that to um, someone that maybe, you know, for another outlet as an athlete, it's not just a camera, but just getting into the sports world. You could see a lot of cool shit by going around the world in the sports world. There's people that work in PR. There's people that work all over. Speak to it from a camera point of view, how much cool things that you've seen with a camera in the sports world. Well, <clears throat> I'm from a small town called Carbondale, Illinois. It's 24, 25,000 people. That population hasn't changed since I left. It's a 50% poverty rate, right? People live below the poverty line. I think the average household median income where I'm from is $18,000 a year. Mm. A year. Yeah, that's wild. Right? Um, so all I wanted to do when I left high school was to get out of there and then go see the world doing something. You know, I had older people I looked up to where I'm from that played in the NBA. Troy Hudson, um, Chris Carr that played at uh, Southern Illinois University. Rashad Tucker played all over the entire world, and I felt like he was better than all of them. So I had the blueprint. I was like, I'm going to just play basketball, and I'm going to go overseas or go to the NBA with these guys. Once that wasn't the reality anymore, that was still my dream. I wanted to travel the world. I can honestly say now, because it's easy to say now, I've made way more money than I would have did playing basketball if I wasn't in the NBA overseas. I've traveled all over the world because before Anatomy of Fighter, I was traveling all over the world as well with this camera. So I feel like sometimes things ain't meant to be. Listen, when I was 19, I tore my ACL. You know the first thing I said when I landed on the ground after I got undercut? I looked in the sky, and I was like, God, why me? I swear on my life. I said, God, why me? I was going to the NBA in a year, yeah. 100%. That was not even a question. I guess that's why. Yeah. Because I was able to put, get a camera in my hand, and the creativity of my life exposed me to so many more important people, so many beautiful things that I've been a part of because I actually chose another, like I developed another passion. If I was to tell anybody out there that's pursuing one thing, it's always work on that plan B, not 
think meaning you can't put all your attention towards your dream if you're a young athlete you want to play in the nba if you're a filmmaker do you want to make movies but you always got to think of something else with this whole coronavirus thing i'm thinking of it right now you see what i'm saying it's like yo i gotta have other stuff to do rather than just focusing on one thing you know yeah so that actually is a good lead, though, to the next thing. Like, uh, you know, no one's really dealing with this too well. But in terms of the coronavirus, what you've built is an independent company and an independent brand that you own. So you're not really relying on, I mean, obviously shoots have slowed down for you. But just talk about how the risk that you've taken to put all the gambles in on yourself and not work for a company to, but to work for yourself and build anatomy of a fighter your a lot of your income is off of youtube so you're still getting that while this is going off i mean you don't have to stunt on anything like that but i just kind of want you to speak to taking it into your own hands and being like no i'm going to make my own income it's not selling my stuff to all these other people that could profit off of your stuff you're right now getting you know people for people that don't know like i said will probably the most famous stuff that well the most famous clip we'll get into but the most famous scenes that i think he shot is habib Nurmagomedov in his native country in dagestan which is a part of russia and he was over there for ramadan so you could imagine the amount of millions of views that stuff has because habib is a worldwide star so just speak to the point of going independent i know that was a big setup but just speak to the point of being an independent creator you're almost like an independent rap artist who owns his own stuff right yeah well initially my whole idea because you got to understand like before this i had a multi multi six-figure wedding business i did weddings I, I got them all plaques all over my house right now i'm not ashamed of i did weddings and made a lot yeah. of money doing weddings so I was in the negotiating deal business, like how much you gonna pay me to do something. So when I got into this, and fighters wanted to really get work done for me after I, you know, did work for other fighters, what can you pay me? You know, for the uh, first few times, fighters did have to pay me something, you like to make something for them and things like that. And then I kind of learned the business and realized that uh, fighters ain't really making a lot of money. I can't charge them because even if I charge them. Some, you know, you get it like as a film, a thousand dollars. That's really not a lot of money no, for what yeah. we do. So, and they need that thousand dollars. So I say, you know what? But I'm not going to charge fighters. I just give me access, and that's payment enough. And I'm going to make that worth something, right? So I feel like as I started to grow and my relationship started to 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 form, that's all I needed from fighters. And to this day, I don't need anything from fighters except. Being yourself with me on camera. That's the payment. I don't need anything from you. And I feel like I, I was able to build up such a base of content by simply flying myself to cities, buying my own hotels, by spending money on my own food without these fighters on I Will. I don't have to give Will anything. Yeah. Just, he's talented, and I'm going to let him tell my story. Because that's all I wanted to do, and what I want to do is tell Fighter's story. And now, be and now, because of that, you're in. You have just a library worth of priceless footage for the last three or four years in the MMA world. And within those three or four years, Habib went from a star to a mega superstar, yeah. and you were there to document it all. So I'm just putting that into context for people. Will one of the things that I always tell him this, give him the compliment, is he is head first in there's no there's no there's no one foot in one foot out with will if he's doing something he's balls to the wall 100 percent and it's really paid off and in this time for content creators it's something to look at he's sitting at an audience of 430,000 people which you know maybe 10 20 years ago that might be hbo subscription if you just put it into like real like context and numbers so he has this built-in audience he has a library worth of footage and every time people go back to watch it He's not getting paid crazy dough, but he's getting paid a percentage, and it becomes a stream of income that helps you in a time like this. Um, and yeah, I just think it's awesome. I told, I was telling, I had this talk with him off camera like a couple of weeks ago. It's just his his risk has really paid off, and I think it's super dope. Um, you want to look at some of these comments, Will? I know, yeah, I know, I see you reading. Yeah. I'm looking at some of these comments. What kind of who got some questions for us both? 
Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of MMA fans on here, so I know everyone's disappointed that Habib's not fighting. Uh, they just announced Gaethje versus Tony. I think that's a tough fight, man. I think Tony's got a tough fight on his hands with Gaethje. I'm a big fan. Listen, shout out to Tony Ferguson. He a beast, but when it comes to matchups, this is just not the matchup for him. Yeah, um, it's kind of impressive. To be honest, it's kind of it's kind of impressive. Tony's taking the fight. Justin ain't got nothing to lose. No. He's coming off the couch with a chance to be interim champ and then fight Khabib. So, for Justin, there's not as much pressure as Tony, for sure. I got uh, Gaethje. Uh, knockout. And I'm, I will bet my house and everything I own that this fight is not going five rounds. No, regardless if it's a dark submission or KO, it's not going five rounds. These fighters don't go five rounds. I'm still not certain that it's going to happen. Hate to be the negative person. I want to see it happen. Obviously, we're sitting out here FaceTiming to kill time, but I want to see the fight happen. But I'm not certainly sure it's going to happen. It really depends if how I things have progress. To put a percentage on it, I'll say 80 20. That it happens? That it happens because they're not going to release the location. I told you that earlier because if they do, I just seen a Twitter comment. All these politicians, all these people are just going to attack the UFC and the location to get it canceled. So they're not going to. Will, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss out one more uh, question from my boy back east here, Rome. How, how much of a fight, I'll answer my, que my answer after, but how much of a fight fan were you before you got involved uh, filming Friends or Michael Johnson or whoever it may be? You want to, that's a good one. Boxing is my favorite combat sport. In terms of, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much of a UFC fan I was from a perspective of just watching it, a 2. I knew John Jones was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew Anderson Silver was, Chell Sonnen, because they had some famous fights, right? I knew Rashad Evans was. Ali in I the could, building. What's up, Ali? Ali, Ali! <laughs> I could care less about MMA at first. And then I got around the fighters. And you know who they reminded me of? Myself. The fighter in me, the grind, the starvation, the nights you ain't got no food. Man, your rent is due next week, but fuck. Yeah. I got to shoot a $300 rap video just to get, you know. Yeah. Some of these guys is homeless, sleeping on their teammates' couch for a year. I did that as a filmmaker. I lived in extended stays for two years. Two years. With one night to go in the, the rape. Just changed to thirty nine ninety nine. I got eighty dollars. I hit up one of my old rappers, the real P or Mo Man in Minneapolis. Yo, I'm doing a special for one hundred and fifty dollars. I give you two videos. Two? Yeah, you got to shoot them now though. Right. I need that money to stay in the hotel for the next week. Right. Like, it's the it's the grind. Yeah, you, you respect them. That's what fighters go through. And then also the other thing is, is you get around fighters, and then you start to see them for the people that that they are, and then it's just then you're locked in. Then you'll never miss another one of their fights because you care about them as a person. So that's always gonna. Um, elevate in terms of how much you care about the sport. I know I started 2012 filming and kind of I was the same thing like much more of a boxing fan but I got around certain guys that I was filming and then I never missed another one of their fights and then you learn the sport and then once you start to learn certain things you know you, you those cliches of oh it's boring on the ground that starts to go away because you're starting to understand a lot more of what they're doing that was just my personal thing and then once you get really invested in then it's like I don't miss a fight now. Now I don't and, miss a fight. And, and I feel like the people, don't, people don't understand this. Because a lot of people wish for me to be like, oh, you're, or they, they tell me, you're, you're biased. You're, they, I am biased in a way. Yeah. I have personal relationships with these fighters. Yeah, but you're not media. That's what people don't understand. So it doesn't matter if you're biased. You're not media. You're documenting it. Yes. Yeah. And, and listen, listen. If I was documenting the Lakers season versus the Warriors, my perspective is going to be from the Lakers. Of course. Right? Of course. Or, or the Cavs. Warriors. 
And then what are people going to say? You're biased. You're only showing the Cavs. I want to see the Warriors too. It's like people don't understand that. Like, yeah, I mean, they, I think people have a hard time distinguishing what's different from media and being a filmmaker. You could be a yes. filmmaker. You don't have to be objective, technically. Yeah. If you're following the one guy, you're just going to tell yeah. his side of the story. It's going to tell, it's going to be from what lens you're telling that story from. If you're coming from a league perspective, you should be a bit objective. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when, when, when do you when do you when do you think if you had to give a guess when do you think we're gonna get back to normal? Hmm. If I had to give a guess at this point, I'd say June. I don't know if it's gonna be normal, but I think we're gonna start to attempt to go back. I think by June we're gonna have. Yeah, I think whether it's gonna be what type of regulations will be, it's gonna have to be. I mean, it's it's early April. I mean, hopefully, we're just just hoping for the best at this point. Um, praying for the best that these numbers start to just go down and that we. Ha but who knows? I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. But if they pull Ali, off this, Ali, if they. Ali, you got a question for us, Ali? Ali there? He, he might have bounced out. <laughs> no, he just started live. I just see he just started live. He just started a live. Um, yeah. So, so, so then talk to me. Um, just where anatomy of a fighter is is going in terms of the brand. I know we've talked about it off camera in terms of right now, if you look at your site, a lot of it's MMA, but you want to tell the anatomy of a fighter of, yeah, it could be a boxer, it could be an MMA, but it could also be that single mom that's, you know, that's struggling to pay the bills. Like you obviously are a good storyteller. So I don't know if you want to tell all your things, but just talk about the brand of anatomy of a fighter in terms of it's not just fighting. It's about the yeah. anatomy of the of the actual men. Yeah, go ahead. Fighting life. Yeah. Like, anatomy of a fighter ain't about anatomy of fighters. Everybody is a fighter in life. We all fight now, right? So I feel like people don't understand that. You can do the Anatomy of Fighter Presents, a, a documentary about Kevin Durant uh, recovering from his Achilles injury. Right. It can be anything. Right. Right? It can be Tiger Woods. You get access to Tiger Woods, you do something on his recovery from his back surgery. Like, Anatomy of... I just built the brand with fighters, but it's going to become bigger than that. And no one should hate that. Um, I, I'm already predicting it. I'm predicting putting other stuff on the platform and then fans is like, what is this? Definitely. They oh, they're players. definitely going to hate on that. They're going to do this like, but you have to endure all that. Because yeah. then people will eventually see what your vision is. And that's the reason why, for me, I love the YouTube platform. And it's, when we talked about this the other day, it's not going anywhere. It's only going to get bigger. But I, I am going to branch off and do bigger things for the brand and for me personally because this was a this was by accident. Yeah. Like I wasn't supposed to do this. So I had big I listen, short film, put it in Sundance, nominated in Tribeca, Hollywood. That's the goal. That's what I wanted to do. I have ten to twelve scripts that are written that I've done over the course of years. So it's other things that I want to do, but that's why this is so beautiful. Because it wasn't meant like I didn't stress out about this becoming big. It just I just do this and I enjoy it. I love telling me these guys are my friends i think so that's, i don't even feel like i'm filming i think that's so dope though man because you everyone tries to get a plan set before they actually do something you just yeah. did did kept doing kept doing kept doing kept doing and it turned into what it turned into what and did you it, call me what did you say i am i forget uh uh you said you either this or that it's what is the extremist or what? Oh yeah, you're definitely an extremist. Extremist. Yeah, you're extremist definitely an extremist. Somebody. It's all. It's look, that's the that's the ability of being a creator. I'm gonna tell you what it, the seeds that planted that mindset. Remember in 2008 when a 5D Mark II came out? Yeah, of course. It was a they did a behind the scenes on it as Canon always does. Dude had a 5D Mark II and he had a laptop and he did. It was the behind the scenes of him shooting this documentary about a fighter or something like that he was like this th with this camera you can live out of a suitcase and travel the world and tell stories with a laptop yeah and i was just like that's me that's my purpose yeah i didn't see the video until about i think it might have came out around the time that i uh 
did the film. I mean, I started the film. Listen, I, I'm in Vegas right now. I could be living in London or L.A. tomorrow. I don't care because I don't have anything holding me back, and I'm willing to risk it all to become successful in life, and that's just the way I live. Yo, and that is not, as the kids say, cap right there because this dude moves around more than anybody I've ever seen in my life. In just, in just as long as I've known him, he's been in Florida like three times, Minneapolis, Vegas, L.A. This, I moved from, from New York to L.A. three and a half years ago, and you were in and out of here within that time. Of, I mean, this dude just moves, man. He just moves. When I get off the phone, off this, I might be back in LA yeah. after me had today, and I just got to Vegas four months ago. Right. So, uh, Will, anything that you got upcoming that you want to uh, talk about? Uh, any fighters? Any upcoming fighters? Actually, you know what? Just give me. This is kind of a, a, a who's some of your favorite fighters to film. Shout out to Carlos Savage. I see y'all in there. Um, Carlos Khabib. Honestly, Photo, what's Khabib. up, bro? I love the Khabib camp. Not just Khabib. It's just the whole camp. It's like a reality TV show. I love them. They all got... I could do videos on each one of those individual, and it's going to attract a lot of attention because that just... The tightness of that family. Um, but the person I bond with the most is Kamal Uzman. He was, he was there the first day I ever went into an MMA gym. That's my brother. I've been there with him when people was telling me, why are you posting this bummy, boring guy to when he wasn't getting 200 views? I can care less. Like, I'm going to be with Kamar Uzman whether he holds the title for the next 10 years or if he loses it in his next fight. We have a bond so much that I love filming him. And obviously, he was with me recently. I love Sugar Sean O'Malley. Yeah. That's my guy. Yeah, he's, he's cinematic, man. Swag. Yeah. Everything about him is a star. Yeah, I, I I was impressed filming him, man. He got swag. He he just he's cinematic. When you just put the camera on him, it just looks good. Everything about him. So I, I feel like when it comes to a, a few fighters that I love, and and I, 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 Henry Cejudo is up there. He won one and two for me. I think because of his antics lately, people tend to forget how great of a, a competitor he is. But also, the dude is eloquent and educated and smart, man. And, and I could film him all day, Henry Cejudo. All right. Uh, let's talk about, I would assume this would be your most famous footage ever shot. Um, this is a time we were together. We're, we're, we're kind of stuck at the hip at this moment for the rest of our life here. But as everyone remembers, when Connor had the legendary Dolly attack on the bus, we were, this is back in 2018, we were all leaving Media Day, and I'm following Habib for the show Embedded, and Will is following Habib for Anatomy of a Fighter, and as Habib's personal guy in terms of, you know, he goes everywhere with him. And at the end of the... Uh, Mr. Organic? Yeah, at the... At the end, when we're getting back on the bus, me and Will are sitting right next to each other. And uh, a couple of fighters get on, and there's no room for them. So I didn't take the bus over, so I'm feeling guilty. I volunteered to get off because I wasn't on the bus over. But we were done filming for the day. We were all done. I was just going to walk back to the hotel, which was kind of close. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna do it too. And Will stayed in the exact same spot, in the spot that we were both sitting. I, well, he was on the, he was inside to the window. I was in the aisle, and I'll let you pick it up. Just talk about that, that famous shot that you have, um, and just, I mean, that shot is gonna go down in history. You know what's crazy is that for a split second, I was gonna walk back with you because I was just like, this is over, right? Yeah. Uh, for a split second, and then I, what's crazy about it is, you know how the elevators at the Barclays. Close, open and close. All I wanted to do is get established a shot for an uh, exit. All right, we done. Episode over. With. You soon. How many seconds would you say that? Ha I honestly, I mean, I hate to exaggerate because I like to be a a, a, a realistic dude. I want to say by the time I got off the bus, thirty seconds. <laughs> Connor and about fifteen people ran down the Barclays ramp. You know what's crazy? How famous that footage is. You would have got the exact same shot. I know. I know you would have been ready. As soon as you saw, it's secrecy. Synchrony. Like, I would have pulled it up, you would have pulled it up. Yeah. I don't 
don't know. Only thing that I can say about that, I've talked about it so much, is that instantly I saw Connor. Like, I knew it was him, and I didn't say anything. Same. So well, I just started filming him. And then I'm just filming him thinking he's just beating on the bus. Like, I'm I'm thinking they're not going to do anything. But when he picked the dolly up, I said, I'm going to film it, and I don't care if he hits me with it. Because in my mind, I was like, if he hits me with it, I'm paid. Yes, for I'm real. I'm paid, right? And it hit the between, the, like the little strip that prevented it from going all the way through a window. And um, yeah, the rest is history, man. I don't want to, you know. Yo, if you've never seen that, as soon as you get off here, first go subscribe to Will's channel. But watch that clip, man. It's uh. UFC 223, so search Will's page for it. It is an insane clip. The glass just breaks all in front. Um, we were all filming for Embedded, so I was on the outside. I remember I had a C300 and uh, the old one, the Mark I, and when I flipped it on, I was filming him probably about five seconds before it actually recorded because it took a while for the camera to warm up, progress record. And the first thing I have is him banging the window on the bus. And then he turned around, ran away, and my shot's like wide. And then you have that perfect shot where he gets the through the glass, which is just insane. You know what's crazy, though? I, this is the most memorable part of that clip will always be when he was over. And I went to the back of the bus. And Khabib is back there laughing and talking with everybody on the bus. And I said, I got the clip right because they... That's, that it was kind of look. So I show everybody the footage. Reed Harris, all these people are on the. Khabib looked at Ali, and he was like, "Brother, take this footage and go get him a hundred thousand dollars, brother. He deserves this, brother. Get him." And then Ali is like, "No, we can't do that." He's like, "Brother, he, he deserved. He uh, he needs a lot of." Khabib looking out. Just, just, he was looking out for me. Khabib was looking out for me. He was like, "Brother, listen." If somebody says something like, go get him some money. No, he said, brother, this is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> Khabib knew. He knew in the mid. So think about it. With all this going on, Khabib is looking at me saying, brother, you can make this is my your check. This is it. Yeah. Get some money. In chaos, his brain doesn't skip any late. He's nah, like this, man. I know there's always going to be haters that are talking trash, but I've been around a lot of athletes. Uh, for those that don't know, I've been NBA, LeBron, Mayweather. Khabib's mentality is second to none. You are not in the face of the biggest chaos or the... He just don't skip. He's just like this. The dude's the most level-headed, laser-focused person I've ever seen. It's crazy, like, when they just have the press conference with Tony, and, you know, they was going back and forth, and then we get backstage, and he look at me, and he like, what's going on, brother? <laughs> yeah, he's just calm. He's calm, and you know what that does for everybody else? Is it brings everybody else's level around like that. All greats are like that. I was in the Mayweather for the, uh, Mayweather's locker room for the McGregor fight. Mayweather sat back everybody before they they gave like a five minute call to go out he asked what the pay-per-view numbers were he they weren't high enough he told everyone to sit back down he said well we need we, we need a little chance to get so he has the whole world waiting on him to come out and he's checking numbers just getting his head massaged dude's it's, just it's, it's crazy because like when he fought connor that was another one i have it i, I have the footage because i don't release everything he uh Javier wants him to work out because I think Tony is fighting Pettis or something, right? So, you know, I think it's one more fight or something before him. He on the phone with people back in Dagestan showing the locker room, laughing, speaking in Russian. And Javier looking like, come on, let's go. And I'm like, bro, he's going to fight Connor and he don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I remember they were showing uh, the parades going on in Dagestan. Yeah. 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 And he laughing, he on FaceTime with people. Yeah. He did that in uh, Abu Dhabi too. Like he yeah. just yeah. like sitting there, don't even care. It's just that's a different mentality. And that's the reason why like when I went on Rogan and I I said I was like, I just when I said I don't think he ever gonna lose, like if he loses it's gonna be some freak of nature loss. Like just some freak of nature loss. Because that will, that mental, uh, it's just going to be hard to break that, man. Like, yeah. you're not tapping them out. He's not tapping. Yeah, I think it's hard for Americans to understand how singular-focused he is. 
Because yeah. we don't grow up with laser vision like that. Or most Americans I could speak to. Yeah, it's yeah. laser vision. There's not... There's not fashion he's into. There's not this. It's like it's like that, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. I feel like NBA I players, it's like, oh, I got my yeah, business yeah. this, I got this, I got that. It's like, nah, nah, nah. He's like, like that. I'm, ha- I'm, I'm happy to, the, when we go back in history, when it's all said and done, I will be Khabib Howard Cosell. Like Ali was. I'm just his personal Howard Cosell for That's that dope. relationship. That's a dope way to look yeah. at it. Yeah, I'm just Howard Cosell. I'm his voice. Anytime Muhammad Ali needed a voice, Howard Cosell was there. Um, Khabib, that camp is tight, man. They don't let you in. It is blood in, blood out. It's not. Yeah. He's loyal to a fault. And with, with that loyalty, loyalty comes expectations from you as one of the brothers, too. You know, I always compare them to, like, the Lycans from Underworld. They the Lycans. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're like a wolf pack, right? Yeah. And um, Khabib is a leader, and the leader always lead from the front, but everybody else fall in line. And you've seen it obviously over the last couple of years. It's a, it's a, it's a. I'm honored to to have that, and that's all Ali. Ali put that together. People can say what they want to say about Ali Abdelaziz, but he literally told me maybe a week after knowing him, "Hey, I got this fighter named Khabib. You know who he is? Russian. He got millions of followers." Right? He might have had like a million or two at the time. I think y'all would be perfect for each other. He put it together. Yeah. That's crazy. That's dope. He knew it. That's so. dope. Um, what do you have to... Uh, what do you have to just... I'm going to leave you with this. What do you have to, uh, to do for, for young filmmakers or independent filmmakers? Um, what advice are you giving them? Um, it could be cliche if it's true. You know what I mean? Because I think one of the, you know, hard work and just patience, because it's going to eventually work out if you keep grinding at it like you did from music videos to weddings to this. It just leads to leads to more. But what's your one thing that you would would you would tell uh, a young filmmaker? Is I think we've all heard this. Embrace the grind, enjoy the grind. But it's don't skip the steps. I didn't skip the steps. Why you want to jump the steps? That's the reason why I'm a better uh, filmmaker because I I was struggling. I didn't have money. I was, you know, borrowing people's car to go shoot music videos, sleeping on the couches of my boy in Orlando because I got paid $600 to go shoot a music video in Orlando, Orlando with a rapper that I don't know, but he's going to pay me $600. It's like that. And then try to become better at whatever area you are in. So when I did music videos and I was living in Minneapolis, no, I want to be the best, one of the best in the city. That's it. I want to be every rapper in the city. I want to be the best. When I did weddings, oh, I got to get a award from Wedding Wire or not. I got to get better. I got to see what I'm doing wrong. Each step, I just wanted to be good or known at, and eventually you get there. Listen, in this generation, everything is viral based. You can go from two subscribers on YouTube to a hundred thousand within a month if you get the right ingredients and circumstances. I could care less about the subscriber count or the view count. It's all about making stuff that's good for you, and you're gonna be happy with it at the end of the day. Because once eventually you start getting into real meetings, and they can see the meat of your sandwich. Then you appreciate the journey because you didn't skip any steps. And that's the thing. I look at the first videos I did for Anatomy and Fighter, and now I look at the ones I do now. And it seems I did way a long time ago that I'm like, no, I should start doing that uh, more or vice versa. So at the same time, it's like don't skip the steps and embrace the grind, you know? What, um, last thing here. What, uh, out of like once the money's out of the way and you become established now that you're just you're obviously I mean you've always chased it for the love but that eventually got you to the point where you're financially stable which is the goal right to do what you love be financially stable what are the things that keep you going now like obviously everyone gets motivated by something is it people 
is it is it fans hitting you up being like dude that story I'm so happy you told like what is the things that keeps motivating you or is it just like oh they reacted great to that story of Corey Anderson who needed promotion and I helped that guy do it I told his story and no one was going to put in the resources to tell this guy's story like what is it that gets you off at this point because it nobody that's successful it's the money because that you would just stop it's got to be something that keeps getting the thing that keeps me going is uh, I just feel like I have a lot more goals in the storyteller world that I feel like like I'm not on a world I'm on a worldwide platform with my brand but I feel like there's other things that I want to do so I'm like damn if there's so many other things I want to do the story is not complete but more importantly it's people like you it's young filmmakers I'm a huge like I watch YouTube films more than I do Netflix or Vimeo. I realize there's so many talented people out there. Listen, I'm talented and I know it, but there's people way more talented than me that ain't nobody knows and I see their work and I'm like, shit, damn. Yeah. What kind of camera they use? What lens they use? Right. The way they open that opening, that, that transition, that cut. Like, film is obviously, storytelling and creativity is subjective right depending on who watch it if a Khabib fan watch my work it's the best shit ever if Tony fans watch it they might hate it it doesn't matter right so for me it's like I'm, I'm a student I'm always a student it's like that famous quote that Denzel still takes acting lessons even though he didn't Denzel it's like I'm a student so for me it's like I'm always wanting to get better honestly even in the terms of anatomy of a fighter if I said I'm at a five or six, I got four steps to go because I still don't, we talk about the things that I wanted to start including in this storytelling. Yeah. And you know what that will do to the production value of the storytelling. So for me, it's always something, man. It's always something. Dope, man. Yo, appreciate your time, bro. Thank you for coming on, man. No problem, man. Hey, a lot of people wanted to know the hairstyle, man. You <laughs> Yo, it's quarantine, bro. What you I want me to do? You got to turn it, you got to turn it to the side, though. Well, it used to be a part know, here. Man. If you check it, yeah, it was a part. Yeah, you know don't hate on the haircut. Next time I'm All coming right, on with a do rag. All right, bro. All hey, right. hey, shout out, shout out to the cash is here in the um the comments right here. He's yeah. a filmmaker from Miami. He got a, a movie out. All right, I'll uh, definitely Mount follow Fighting. him. Bro, he is. I swear on my life, he's gonna win an Oscar one day. I'm gonna check it he's out. That good, and that's what I mean. He's gonna win. I got more followers than him. He don't got a YouTube channel. But he shoot. He shot a feature film. He's gonna win an Oscar one day. Shout out to him, man. That's dope. All right, man. All right, bro. Peace. Holla. Peace. Thank you guys for tuning in. Mm -hmm.